स्थापकाय च धर्मस्य सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिने अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णाय ते नम वसुदेव सुतम देवम कंसचानूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णं वंदे जगत गुरुम So in the last class, we were studying the thirty-eighth sloka of the second chapter of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, where we find that the idea of karma yoga, the real motive for our, all all our actions, should be established in karma yoga or equanimity in action. where one performs action without hankering for the results and we found that sri krishna initiated the instruction on karma yoga from this 38th verse which we were studying in the last class so what's the sloka sukhe dukhe same kritva labha labhu jaya jayau tato yudhyaya yujyasva naivam papam avapsyasi so the regarding regarding alike the pleasure and pain sukhe dukhe samakritva the pleasure and pain you are not elated by the pleasure not depressed by the pain so you treat them alike and what labha labho jaya jay the same with gain and loss with victory and defeat all these happenings of life do not affect you at one moment you are just in the peak of ecstasy in the another moment you are in the abe of dejection so as if the happening of life we are slave to them so we have to get detached the basic idea behind karma yoga is that suffering is not because of the happenings of life the suffering is because how we react to the happenings of life so there the reaction is the main thing where we have to train ourselves it needs sufficient training which cannot be acquired through academic knowledge that in our workplace we find that the biggest cause of our turmoil and tension is not the lack of our skills in the present world we find that many are there who are learned who are suffi- have sufficient skills but the main issue arises when they find that from their childhood the entire education process was just in gathering information it never entailed in any short of internalizing the values in the words of swami vivekananda that strengthening of the muscles strengthening of the nerves that you should have muscles of iron nerves of steel that is nerves of steel speaks of the practice of detachment that nothing can affect me in all the situations of life if we can act that way then there is no question of incurring so called sin naivam papam avapsyasi and that's the idea of karma yoga i was just initiated with this sloka so we were studying in details we need not go to that discussion again let us proceed to the next sloka the 39th sloka which is a continuation of the idea of karma yoga which bhagwan sri krishna 
is going to initiate in Bhagavad Gita. The 39th sloka of the second chapter. Esha te abhihita sankhye buddhir yoge tvimang srinu buddhya yukto yaya partha karma vandham prahasyasi. So there are two ways he's speaking of. Esha te abhihita sankhye that be detached in life. That speaks of Sankhya, the Jnana Yoga. This Sankhya, Sankhya speaks of Jnana Yoga. The word Sankhya came from Sankhya. So in the Sankhya philosophy, the, it starts with the enumerating the various evolutes of nature, the 24 evolutes of nature that speaks of Sankhya, the count. And all those evolutes of nature with which we are attached, we are identified, not only attached, we are identified, we think we are those evolutes of Prakriti to detach themselves and again get established in your pure nature, the Purusha, the conscious principle, which is bereft of all the polarities of life. It is as it is. It is always in the eternal present. It has no past, it has no future. Past, present, future. These tenses come into existence where there is a transformation. Where there is a movement. If there is no movement, there is no transformation. The time collapses. You are in the eternal present of amnes. That's the real nature of us, which is in the eternal presence of its amnes. And nothing can affect it to be established in that and not get uh, identified with the evolutes of nature, which speaks of those numbers, Sankhya, is the Sankhya Yoga. So till now I was speaking of that developing that detachment. Now the question may come that why he's introducing the Buddha Yoga to Imang Siro. This yoga philosophy is going to introduced by yoga in Bhagavad Gita is meant karma yoga. So why he's going to introduce this yoga? Because when I say be detached, then immediately the question comes and what's the need of action? I can simply renounce the action and sit quietly contemplating on my real nature and that will lead me to spiritual evolution entering my liberation. So what's the need of action? So here Bhagavan is introducing the Karma Yoga by saying that till now I was just speaking that you are the self, so don't be attached to the actions. At the same time, Krishna has already what you say that was discouraging Krishna, uh, Arjuna from retreating from the war. He was encouraging him to take participate in this righteous war. And at the same time, he's saying, be detached. So there is a chance of confusion and that we will find. Arjuna do gets confused at the very beginning of the next chapter, when we come to that chapter, that now he's speaking of this detachment. Now he's speaking of getting totally involved with the war. So that's why Bhagavan is now introducing another yoga. He's got his buddhi yoga. To Imang Srinu. Buddhya yukta yaya partha karma bandham prahasyasi. So when you do your actions, let's listen to this wisdom of yoga, armed with which, O partha, you can break through the bonds of karma. So what is this buddhi yoga and what is this sankhya? So just let us have a very short discussion on this sankhya and yoga as has been indicated in the Bhagavad Gita as the two distinct paths. The Sankhya speaks of the true nature of the absolute reality, just as we were saying. So this wisdom actually refers to the Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, which teaches the discrimination between the real and the unreal. There's a Viveka, discrimination. First, have that Viveka. 
and the viveka should be followed by vairagya and once you discriminate between the real and the unreal there should be an inner urge aspiration to renounce the unreal once i know a thing which is a flow constantly changing behind that something is there which is permanent why should i be attached with the flow and be dejected because be constantly suffering for that why not detach myself from that so the question is how that attachment came it is because of agyana how it came we don't know it somehow came somehow the self which is not supposed to get attached with the body mind complex got attached to the body mind complex we can give the example of ego when you are standing in front of a mountain and you shout you shout most probably your own name and it appears as if from the mountain somebody is calling you it is a echo so actually it is you who are shouting but it appears as if someone from the mount mountains is calling you in your voice so that has happened because of ignorance the same thing they hear this just the way that ignorance makes me feel my own voice to be someone else's voice as if i am listening to it it is coming from the mountains the sound i get as the sound which is mine gets associated with those mountains the mountain ranges similarly here when the self get reflected in the body mind complex that reflection like the echo is makes us forget our real nature i start thinking that reflection to be real to be me now this results in that in the in, in gyana yoga what is the main idea once this identification happens then we go through life and death again and again and which results in shoka and moha in shankaracharya's commentary they will be using these two words grief and delusion shoka moha we take this these words we are so familiar with these words we take these words literally but what actually the shoka and moha means shoka grief moha delusion so this repeated words when we go through this process of shoka and moha then this if you really study these words it can really very very nicely relate with the modern psychological terms in the modern psychology they say that in life when we go through the various challenges of life sometimes we feel that there is no way out and they term it as inescapable trauma i am in a state from where as if there is no escape inescapable trauma so that we can translate as shoka and that inescapable trauma leads to results in in the modern psychological language they say learned helplessness you learn from that state that i am helpless i cannot help myself i cannot in any way come out of this situation and from that we find at some point of life that we reach the peak till from when we were young we were all aspiring we had full of optimism so the life always swings from this optimism and a peak comes and then that pessimism enters or oh, somehow i have to adjust with the life just the life will pass i cannot achieve as such anything that inescapable trauma results in that learned helplessness from where you find that optimism has ended up in pessimism why it happens the examples which we give so many times that in life when you are passing through some trauma we learn helplessness and that results in defeatist attitude we develop a defeatist attitude just to give an example in india uh, these are the examples uh, sometimes this uh, you may immediately say that their animal rights and all uh, thing that has been violated yes most probably but these examples helps us to understand this example whether it should be done or not irrespective of that fact that in india we will find in temples that uh, 
elephants are being domesticated. They're used for that taking the deity in procession. They're treated as sacred. Now, when in the process of domestication, when these elephants were young, they were infant, they were small. Now, these elephants can have tremendous strength to domesticate them. So some tricks are used. What's the trick? As a small infant, the elephant is tied with a strong iron chain. One of its legs is tied with a strong iron chain with a stump. And this baby elephant tries its best to escape. Throughout the day, it goes on fighting and it finds it cannot escape. And this elephant, when it grows, it's a huge elephant, tremendous strength it has. Now, the one who takes care of this elephant, he simply has to tie one of the leg of that elephant with a just a rope, simple rope with one kick, he can easily come out of it. With one rope, he will tie and with a stem stump, he will keep it tight and the elephant throughout the day will be standing quietly. What it speaks of? Learned helplessness. It can easily come out of that bondage. But from the, in the childhood, when the strong chain was there, he tried its best, it couldn't. Now this small rope makes him feel that he has no power to come out of this bond. So there are innumerable examples. There are some experiments conducted in laboratory to speak of this learned helplessness. So this gives the defeatist attitude that I am defeated, I can do nothing in life. So this is the thing which happens for all of us when we are going through the cycles of birth and death again and again, why it is happening. Now let us try to understand from that example of that echo, that when I am shouting my name, it comes from the mountains. I think the mountain, from the mountain, someone is calling me. Same thing happens the moment the conscious principle gets identified with even a single cellular organism. Forget about the advanced human being. For the first thing it happens, immediately it thinks it is that my, the small uh, multicellular, uh, single, single celled organism, the small, minute, small organism. The consciousness, which is beyond time space, con this condition is now getting limited in that micro body. And what happens? You will find it reacts to stimuli. It will be responding. If there's a more heat, it will try to avoid, it will try to go to the shed. If there is more humidity, more salinity, saline water, there's a, this pH has to be within certain range. It is always avoiding, why? Now, as it is identified with this body, it will be going towards the nutrients. It will be avoiding the toxin. Now it starts thinking that I am this body. Now, very interesting. But from that body, what is the echo coming? The echo of that original self is coming. That you are immortal. You are perfect. You are immortal. And nothing can kill you. Nothing can change you. That is coming from that self. But the echo is being heard from that small micro body. Now the micro body hearing that ego is constantly asserting the fact that it is eternal. So it doesn't want to die. It is always away from toxin. It is driving towards the nutrition because now it's identified with the body. And with that, the idea is that I have to be eternal. There cannot be any death. And it is this attempt of that simple micro body to be eternal. It is already eternal, but now as it has got identified with the body and is trying to realize the eternity through the body, now the entire process of biological evolution starts. Vedanta doesn't deny biological evolution. Vedanta doesn't be believe in the design theory where everything has been designed as it is. As the Lord has created the universe, but there is a sequence of evolution. What's that evolution now? That because of that ignorance, now you find that Ajnana, it is already perfect. But now because of Ajnana, as it is getting identified with that micro body, it tries to realize the eternity through it. 
Now, what's the entire biological evolution is? The entire process of biological evolution is nothing but the conglomeration of sensor, cells, the small micro bodies, and where the division of labor starts so that I can cope up with the environment in much better way. Take the human body, the, which is at the epitome of the evolution, biological evolution, that so many specialized organs are there to take part of, to take care of, certain activities the in when we were a microbe a single cell was doing everything digestion circulation respiration all the functions was with a single cell now i have equipped myself with the process of evolution that there is the heart for taking care of the circulation so this digestion for the different organs are there for excretion for respiration for metabolism it's a, such a sophisticated machine, you can say. Why? Because to realize that eternity, which is echoing from that body, my attempt is to make it eternal. That body, that which something is saying eternal, that should be eternal. And now you will find from Ajnana, from life after life, you are doing that. And what's the cause of our grief? We find it is impossible. At last, it ends in grief, that inescapable trauma resulting in that moha, learned helplessness with a defeatist attitude. And that's why in life, with all our optimism, unless we have that spiritual orientation, it is bound to end up in pessimism. You cannot, you cannot help it. You find that the nature has given you so many things at certain point of time, youth, health, vigor, energy, name, fame. There is no need for any other being to snatch it away from you. At certain age, the aging process starts, other the nature itself will take away everything. Nothing will stay with us. And at last, our destiny is waiting there in the grave. Everything will be taken and this process repeats. And that's the reason for this learned helplessness. Where spirituality comes into picture, the moment we become aware of our spiritual dimension and immediately realize that it is the ego which is deluding me to realize the eternity in the body, I'm already eternal. If I just know my real nature, I'm eternal as I was trying to realize that eternity through that body-mind complex, this entire process of biological evolution started and that's at last result in this dejection. No fulfillment can be found through that. With all my efforts, endeavor in the worldly sense, it cannot give me any fulfillment. But the moment I become aware of the spiritual dimension, the problem is solved. Now I become detached. This, uh, in the difference between biological evolution and the Vedanta's idea of evolution is that in biological evolution is a straight line. It goes on evolving. There is no end as if we will go on evolving for better, for better. It is an infinite straight line. But in Vedanta, the evolution is a cyclic process. We start from perfection because of ignorance, the biological evolution ensues. As a human being, we have the capacity to realize that I am the self. And then my endeavor for realizing the eternity through body-mind complex stops. That speaks of renunciation. I get detached. And I try to re-establish myself in my real nature. And the first thing is that the moha stops. Why? because you have found the answer. For lives together, you were lost. You never knew the answer to the problem, to the question. You were trying your heart. And why do we didn't find the answer? As we give that example again and again, because all the answers cannot be found in the dimension of existence in which we are at present and unaware of. And we cannot relate to some other dimension which is not palpably visible. 
the moment we cannot, there are some answers which we can find only when you are relating to another dimension. You cannot just find that answer, all the di existing uh, available dimensions of existence. That example which we give again and again. That in a classroom, the teacher asks the students to draw exactly four triangles by joining four points. There shouldn't be any one triangle more or less. Exactly four triangles have to be, uh, you have to draw exactly four triangles by joining four points. How you place the points, it's up to you. Place the four points, you try to place the four points in such a way that you can get exactly four triangles. You were try throughout your life, you can never. So that's what the students were trying. So if you try, you will find somewhere or other, two points will be intersecting to create the fifth point. And apart from there, exactly four triangles you won't get because there will be the sub triangles that means two triangles will make the, another big triangle. So it will be more triangles as well as the, there will be more points because the lines will intersect. So by joining four points to get four triangles is almost impossible. So then at last the teacher himself just uh, gave the solution. What's the solution? Say so he marked three points in the blackboard and asked the student to imagine the fourth point in the space, not in the blackboard, in the space. Now you join the three, three points, you get one triangle. And from each point, you draw a line, imaginary line to that point, which is in the space, you will get a triangular pyramid. You'll get a triangular pyramid. So the answer was so easy, but why we didn't get it? Because even for lives together, if you we were trying, we would never get the answer. As long as we are trying to find the answer in the dimension, in the two dimensions of your page or the blackboard the length and the breadth. You have to take the height, the space into consideration. Otherwise you don't get the answer. So that's what happens. That evolution is cyclic. When the cyclic cycle is completed, again, we take the spiritual dimension of our existence into our purview to find out the puzzle out of this life. And the puzzle is solved. And for that action has no place. I know my nature and the action falls off. And that's the Sankhya Yoga in short. And what is the yoga philosophy that the Karma Yoga, the, here in Bhagavad Gita, as we told, Sankhya means Jnana Yoga and Yoga indicates Karma Yoga. So what is the Karma Yoga? Now, the very basic thing in Karma Yoga, why we are constantly endeavoring. At last you will find all our endeavors is because of three desires, mainly three desires. In Sanskrit they call, they're called Ashanas. What are the three desires? All our desires at last can be boiled down to these three desires. You can categorize them in either any of these three. There are so many desires, but at last you can boil them down to these three desires. What are they? Very nicely, they have been depicted as Putraishana, Vittaishana, and Lokaishana or Yashaishana. Putraishana, your desire for progeny, that speaks of lust. Vittaishana, your desire for wealth. Yashaishana, your desire for name and fame. So, all these three Ashanas. Of, and again, these three ashanas can be boiled down to actually one ashana that, uh, that doesn't have direct relation to this our discussion, but let's just indicate that all these desires we think is my desire by fulfilling which I will get happiness, but actually it is a working of the nature. Prakriti, some it knows very well, as long as it, it can entrap the purusha as if it can go on working. It doesn't want to stop. It wants to go on working. And to go on working, what has it has to do? The procreation has to be there. That we know that I am not going to 
uh, stay through eternity. So I will be continuing this as a psychophysical being, I will be continuing through the next progeny. So this continuation of the progeny is the only intention of nature. So that's why for that putreshana we understand, vitteshana is also easily understood. Why? That unless I sustain myself, if I don't have wealth, I don't have food, I die. If I die, the question of procreation doesn't come. So vitteshana also is linked to putreshana. And you may say yasheshana is something different. No, that is also linked to putreshana. How? If you find in the animal kingdom, even in the human beings also, the same thing. All our endeavors is for what? In the animal kingdom, you will find that the male lion has its own territory. It won't allow any other male lion to enter there. Why? Because it has more chance. If other male lions are not there, it has more chance to propagate its genes. So you find here, this, this is my domain. That speaks of yesha, power, prominence. The same thing with the, the human beings. After all, all the education at last, what? To get a perfect match with all my education establishment. So yesha do has something to do with the continuation of the nature. So here, at last we find this is all these asanas. The nature has devised these asanas in a wonderful way. That if the desire is fulfilled, you will get tremendous happiness. So this happiness, is it really mine? Uh, really I'm getting? No. That is the way the nature is luring us. If you try to find out the nature of happiness, you will find that the nature's intention is never to give us happiness. Its intention is to make us do what it desires us to do by just using the lollipop named happiness. If you just find out the nature of happiness, you will find the nature's intention is never to give us happiness. Why? That whenever any of these desires which we have, whether it's putraishana, vitteishana, yashaishana, whatever it may be, at last what it happens? The moment the desire is fulfilled, you find you're in ecstasy. In the modern uh, so-called neurological language, biological language, we will say the dopamine is released. Uh, the dopamine is released. But why not have been, we been equi uh, that, uh, equipped in such a way that the dopamine remains there, that we are in happiness? No, it, there will be a depletion. There will be a peak, but there will be a depletion. So if the, there are four steps, aspects to understand the nature of happiness, how it's fooling us. So there is a peak, but there is a depletion. The third thing is very important. We always rem remember the peak, we forget the depletion. That both were fact that we had an ecstasy and it went off. So next time, why should I be encouraged for that? But I always forget the depletion. That ecstasy is the thing which is always in my prominent in my mind. And that's why a criminal con does, does this crime. We are doing, we are repeatedly going for the desire. And in the extreme case, a criminal, he, he th only thinks the flowery side of the thing. The, all the challenges, the dangers, that doesn't even reflect in his mind. Because nature has equipped us in such a way. Everything appears to be so rosy. Otherwise, we won't go for it. If at the very beginning I know at last it is going to end up in dejection. I will never go for it. But the nature wants I should go for it. So there is a peak. The peak is followed by depletion. But I always remember the peak, forget the depletion. Fourth fact is very interesting. You will find in your life so much of elation, happiness is there in anticipation. But when you are in the act, you find you are in plateau. It is boring. Nothing is there. From the morning, you were planning that I will in the evening go to the restaurant, have some food. And when you're sitting in the restaurant, you find it's so so. It's nothing, it's there's nothing to really charm you. Why it happens? In all in the life, you will find anticipation gives tremendous happiness. And when the life starts, it becomes just uh, normal. It doesn't, because once you're anticipating, the nature's what's the nature's goal? That now the one that because of anticipation, anticipation you have already been motivated. 
Now you, that, have, that has created the motivation. So for that, that happiness is there. Once you have been motivated, nature knows now you're going to do it. Nature's intention is not to give you happiness. So happiness has gone. So you are already in flat. And the fifth, another factor is there. If after anticipation, you don't get it, there is a dejection. That also in a negative way is actually motivating you to do the thing which you are supposed to do. Just to give an example, that as, as a nomadic tribe, when we were, when our predecessors were in search of nutritious fruit, they one day got, saw some fruit, climbed up the tree and found it is very sweet. They were related, happy. And they thought that most probably all fruits are sweet. Next day, another, uh, some other tree they saw, it was some different fruit and it was extremely bitter. Most probably it can be poisonous also. The nature has uh, in a very nice way devised uh, this, this uh, in nature, anything sweet is never poison. That's how we got the tendency to take sweet things. The other things, there's a doubt, it may be poison. So now you find the dejection. Now will what it will do? It will help me to avoid that and search for the fruit which is going to save me. So now you will find all these asanas actually is a working of the nature where its intention is to make us its tool in doing the things by which it is propagated. It's in no way going to give you happiness. That's why all the so-called happiness is like that hedonistic treadmill. This is the word, the treadmill, you know, you are running, but you are running in the same place. So all the happiness is like running in the treadmill. Hedonistic, hellish. The word hedonistic means it's hellish. Just in the hell, you are trying to get the satiation, the, that you are trying your best to reach the satiation, it doesn't come. And that's what it's here. You don't have to go to the hell. This life, as long as we are chasing after this desire, it is bound to end up with this hedonistic treadmill. That's the, even for that, no spirituality is required. Even psychology will tell you that this is after all mere short-sightedness. You can never get real happiness through it. Now this same idea, Swami Vivekananda, with a spiritual uh, with the example of a simile is trying to give a spiritual understanding out of it. He's saying a very interesting thing in one of his lectures that our real nature is Sat Chit Ananda Swarupa. Sat Swarupata Chit Swarupata Ananda Swarupata. That Sat means you always exist. It's the negation of the fact that I was born and I will die and I'm going through the transformation. It's the negation of that fact. Actually, I am Satswarupa, and that Satswarupata is Chit Swarupa. It is consciousness, it is not matter. And that Chit Swarupata is Ananda, it's always in bliss. But in our day-to-day life, that bliss we always miss. It may be there for some time. Most of the time we are struggling to get that bliss or we are in dejection. Why it happens? So he's giving a very nice example. That again, that, that the false notion that fulfillment of desire gives us happiness is making us do all these actions. What he's saying is a very nice example that just think your mind is like a lake. And the bottom of the lake is as if your real nature, which is Sat Chit Ananda Swarupa. Now, as long as there are waves in the surface of the lake, I cannot see the bottom. In a swimming pool, when all are swimming, the water is turbulent. The bottom is not visible. When no one is swimming, the water is clear, transparent. If anything has fallen, suppose your ring has fallen, you can see where it has fallen. It's so clearly visible. So our mind is like that lake. It is constantly disturbed with thousands of thoughts, desires, worries, tensions. So these waves are there. When the waves are there, the Satchidananda Swarupa is always there in the bottom, as, as if behind the mind, behind the lake called mind, behind the, this lake, this Satchidananda Swarupa is always there. Your mind, the lake, behind that, the Satchidananda Swarupa is always there. But very interesting. When the waves are there, a selective filtering happens. What is filtered? Sat Swarupata is never filtered. 
I am always aware of my existence, whether I am happy, whether I'm unhappy, Sat Swarupata and Chit Swarupata. I am and I am aware that I am. This speaks of Sat Swarupata and Chit Swarupata. This is always there. I never forget that. What is being filtered out? Ananda Swarupata. That is being filtered out. Now when my desire is fulfilled, what happens? Suppose a small child has thousands of distractions. And the father says that if you get a good grade, I'm going to give a very at the latest brand of this laptop. And now the child, a little renunciation comes. How? That I have to stop my distraction. I have to give more importance to my studies. So he is renouncing the small desires for a bigger desire. To get the laptop, I have to study. So now the mind is cleared of all small waves, all those other distractions. It has been cleared off. They, they have been engulfed by a big wave. I have to get the laptop. So it's a bit focused. Now at last, because of his focused uh, attention and his studies, at last he is, enabled, he is able to get good grades and father, as per the condition, gives him the laptop. The moment he gets the laptop, he's extremely elated. And he thinks the laptop has given him the joy. But actually what has happened, the Swamiji's example is wonderful. He's saying that all the small waves were engulfed by this large wave, that big desire. The moment it is fulfilled, for the time being, there's a let go. There's no wave at all. The mind is calm. All the waves have the subdued. And now the Ananda Swarupata, which was filtered, Sat Swarupata, Chit Swarupata never gets filtered. The Ananda Swarupata gets filtered because of this distraction. That is something within. The thing outside cannot give me happiness. The nature has no power to give me happiness. Happiness is something which is my inherent nature. Nothing in the world can give me happiness. So this real happiness which is within me, which was filtered out because of all these waves of my mind, now becomes something palpably realizable. It's percolates through your mind and body. It's coming from within. It's not coming from without. But I again mistake because of Ajnana that it is the fulfillment of desire. It is the laptop which has given me happiness. Or it is my position in life that has given me happiness. It's again a mistake. So constantly this mistake is again happening. So Shankaracharya very nicely speaks of that why we go on with the karma? Avidya. That happiness is within me. I have forgotten. I'm in search of happiness in all the things of life. I have stretched out my hand outside. I'm in search of happiness. That ajnana, avidya results in karma, desire. And that karma results in karma. So this cycle of avidya, karma, karma makes us go round and round. The cycle of birth and death for how many lives, we don't know. Swami Vivekananda, another example wonderfully is to give. That it is like a bullock which has been tied with a with the oil grinding stone and it is going round and round. That to make the bullock go round and round so that the oil is being grind, grounded in the oil in the olden days in the village, that one stone is to be revolving over the another stone, and all the oil seeds will be between those two. And when the bullock is moving around and the upper stone is revolving uh, above the, uh, the lower stone, then the oil gets grinded. That's the process they used to grind the oil. Now, how to make the bullock go round and round throughout the day? There cannot be just one person constantly forcing the bullock to go round and round. So they devised a nice plan. They will tie a stick on the head of the bullock and in front of that stick, they will hang some straw. The bullock is constantly in search of that, to, is, urge, is in constant urge to get that straw. As it moves forward, it cannot get, because with the stick, it is tied. So the straw also moves forward and the bullock moves on and on. So Swamiji is saying that's our condition. All these Asianas, the desires are like that straw. And the mother nature with all our degrees, like the tail of the bullock, at last we are all bullocks only. <laughs> How long the tail may be. 
<laughs> so at last we are all blogs and the mother nature is making us grind the oil of its nature. And that's all going on. So what's the way out? So now if I say that stop the karma, you are, are already the infinite being. It's again not easy because there is something called karma vega, the past impulse of action, the sanskaras, they are so forceful, it won't allow. Just like a drug addict, the drug addict, it has started really uh, deteriorating his health, is damaging his health, he's going towards death. He knows very well, with his mind he knows very well that the drug is the cause of his deterioration, damage, whatever you may say. But he cannot leave it. Why? This, what my mind says is can be easily can be easily ignored by our the so-called sub latent impressions by sanskaras they are very forceful that's why uh, our yatishwanji used to say a very nice story that you know the, in a, a uh, one girl was kept uh, just to for the babysitting to take care of the child when both the father and mother are working and the child was extremely restless throughout the day, going around the house, plundering things. At the end of the day, when the father and mother returns and find everything messy, they ask the, uh, this, the, the babysitter, the girl, what were you doing? Well, what to do? The child is so restless. And the parent asks, why don't you use your willpower? The girl replied, I, apply, I do apply my willpower, but the child's own power is stronger than my willpower. So that's the problem. The wound power of the child is stronger than my willpower. And we find that even when we understand intellectually that what is binding us, what is forcing us to these repeated actions of avidya kama karma, I cannot stop immediately. Karma vega, that impulse makes me go on. So what's the way out? So there comes the karma yoga, which is applicable for most of us. The way we switch off the fan, when the fan is revolving, it's only a fool who will try to stop the fan by trying to hold the blades. It's going to just injure us. That's not the way. Simply I have to switch off the fan. And then what happens? Does the fan stop immediately? No. It will go on revolving for some time. As long as it's past inertia, the inertia of motion is working on it to stop because some friction is also at last it will stop. So here also the same thing, the actions let it go on. Though I understand that these actions have in, started and shoot from karma and I cannot stop it immediately. What I can do, let me switch off that karma factor, let it go off. Let me try to work. I don't stop the work, but try to be desireless without seeking the result. What in whatever position of life I am, I seek not, avoid not, and go on with my activities in a detached manner that ensures the switching off in time that motion will come to as a stop. But here again, the idea is okay, then yoga means at last, when my chitta shuddhi has happened, then I can renounce the action. Yes, in traditional karma yoga, they speak that karma yoga is a preparation for chit it's a chitta shuddhi. Ultimately, you have to be detached from action. But in Bhagavad Gita, that's not the idea. That's very interesting. Here, Bhagavan will be speaking of the divine worker. That yes, you have any, even when you have detached, still the action can go on. There will be two words in Bhagavad Gita. One is Aruruksha and one is Yoga Arura in the later chapter. That when I'm trying to get rid of all my desires and trying to act selflessly, you are Aruruksha, you're trying to climb up in that state of equanimity. And when I arise, when I've climbed on the top, is my action going to stop? Yes, there are some who thinks, yes, the Chitta should be no more action. But after all, why the universe is, there is some divine behind this creation whose plan is that action should go on. He has given love in the mother. 
to take care of his own nature to the child. It is not mother who loves. She is bound to love. The love is already implanted there. It is programmed there. So he, that Lord, the, the one who is the Purushottama, his guide in Bhagavad Gita, his idea of Purushottama will come much later. That as we told at the very introduction of the Bhagavad Gita, it is neither uh, Advaita, Dvaita, Vishishta Advaita, all the philosophies try to say that our Gita has to be interpreted in our way. Actually, it is a wonderful synthesis which doesn't speak any of the, exclusively of any of this philosophy. It brings the idea of Purushottama where even a Jnani in the words of Sri Ramakrishna now can become Vijnani after realizing he can now instead of taking this all this life as something if seriously can take as a play of the divine for some reason the God wants to play it is his Leela not for my own personal interest why not I take part in this Leela I am a playmate of the divine I am a friend Sakha I am a playmate let me take part in this divine drama. And there the idea will come will much later in Bhagavad Gita that what is the state of this divine worker is Manmana Bhava. It's in the last chapter. So that's why when we are studying Bhagavad Gita, many say the second chapter is the be all and end all of Bhagavad Gita. Later chapters are just explanations. Sometimes by thinking that way, we will miss the point. Actually, it is culminating into some idea. This I, the second chapter is actually speaking of Chitta Shuddhi that is leading to some higher states of spiritual evolution where you need not think of going beyond action. Action can still continue, but not from a total different perspective. That What's that idea? Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakti, the 65th sloka of the 18th chapter. Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Mad Yaji Mang Namashkuru Mame Vaishyasi Satyangte Pratijane Priyosime. Always think of me, be devoted to me, worship me, and offer options to me, offerings to me. Doing so, you will certainly come to me. This is my pledge to you. I'm just assuring you, promising you. For you are my dear. We are all the very dear to God. It's not only Arjuna, though he's addressing Arjuna, the same thing. It is he who is waiting when we turn around to understand this spirituality we can take help of so many metaphors one of the metaphors which is really uh, uh, i like is or the metaphor in the bible it's the story of the prodigal child a wonderful story that why this creation is the god wants to be happy he's happy and that he to experience his own joy he has created. Why he has created? Because even a small child you will find that it is always happy and its happiness is expressed by constantly making, unmaking so many things. It is constantly playing. From our perspective, it has no meaning. But the child is, it is the expression of the child's joy. Making, unmaking things. The creation is like that. He is making, unmaking uh, so many things. Not only that, he has also created sentient beings, something like him, where that man is made as a, as a reflection of God, as a, in the likeness of God. Why? To experience the love. The climax of joy is in love. And love cannot be experienced when you are alone. There has to be someone else. So God who was one has created many to experience his love. Now the, naturally the question comes, to, if to experience his love, he has created us. Then why we are going away from him? We are so much uh, involved with life. We never think of God. If he has created us to think of him, why do we don't think of him? So here also another interesting thing that uh, once uh, Stephen Spielberg's movie, which I watched long back, and it really uh, well, means, uh, which well, has a very deeply imprinted uh, in, my, in my mind is that artificial intelligence. Very nice. Uh, the entire movie I didn't like, but the theme was wonderful. That, you know, the artificial intelligence has been developed so much that a child has been designed to have unconditional love. It will love its mother. But whatever you do to him, it will love its mother. 
but because of some misunderstanding one day what, what what happens that the one artificial child has been uh, one uh, this a parent actually uh, hires purchases one of this artificial child and because of some misunderstanding at last they decide after all it's a machine though it is always loving its mother after all it's a machine so they this, the what they do they think that it's it is after all a machine it is going to uh, create some lot of complications problems it may even kill us because of some misunderstanding i'm not going to the details so they think of just keeping uh, just uh, uh, living it in some deep jungle forest in the name of going for a tour they will take that child they will uh, they will take him down to a forest just as if they are going for a walk and the mother will leave him come back to the car and go away the child will be crying but they won't listen they go away why it is why it has it, it was possible because they know it has been programmed to love me it is a machine what makes us a living being we have a choice when someone is loving me i can reciprocate back the love or i may not the choice makes us a living being and that's why god has to experience his love otherwise love cannot be experienced if you know it's a machine there cannot be love you cannot love a machine when you know that he is such and such a being is bound to love me it's a machine when you know it has a choice it reciprocates then only the love can be experienced and then the joy can be experienced and that's why god has given us the choice but again at the same time he has created the world perfectly imperfect you may go out but you won't find happiness at last you have to turn around and for that it is he who is waiting we say i am waiting for the divine no no the fact is god is waiting for us when we turn around and when we just turn around it is he who comes running if you go one step he will come 16 steps that we say in our scripture that's the idea in the story of the prodigal child that rich man had two children the elder son was obedient this obedient child is not interesting at all he was a obedient child the younger one he wanted to be free so now he when he grew a little he told you give the share of my property i want to live an independent life the father realized that he is not yet mature experienced he tried to explain but he won't understand so the father had at last to yield to his demand he gave a huge share of the property and he left his father but as it was anticipated he was not mature he started plundering the wealth wasted the wealth irresponsibly and in no time he became a pauper and now there is no way out what to do the thought of his father came back but again the fear was that religion starts with fear my father will be angry i wasted his wealth i haven't obeyed him it starts with fear but in god there is no fear this child though he is fearful but there is no way with all his fear and apprehensions that father won't accept me he starts again going towards his own village where his father is from the distance the father sees the child seeing the child he comes running embraces the child brings him back home and there he there's a huge feast in his just to celebrate his homecoming he invites the entire village there's a huge feast so this is the story which really speaks of this the one from whom i am got alienated he is always wanting that again we get one with him he is as if waiting for us manmana bhav bad bhakt and when we become one with us there are two things you can just be in eternal silence with him or from there you can come back now with a total different perspective it is for his joy that he has created let me take part in the joy by reciprocating him through love through remembrance whatever he wants me to do let me do but my mind is with him always as a dedication so that's the real idea of karma yoga if you think that karma yoga is after resulting in chitta shuddhi all the actions will stop well yes that can be a path of spirituality but that's not the idea in the bhagavad gita it speaks of abhyudaya along with nisraya sir 
that atmana mokshartham jagat hitayacha your spiritual liberation is not at the cost of the welfare of the society it is that both goes hand in hand abhyudaya nisrayasa atmana moksha jagat hita so there is no running away i be a part of it and i relate to the world from a different perspective at first it may be a struggle for me to keep that equanimity equipoise but then it becomes my nature and now and that it becomes a nature not just only by practice it takes you to a certain type of realization from where when you come back the world has changed your nature automatically spontaneously changes as swami vivekananda that example again and again we give that when he was passing through the desert as a wandering monk he was thirsty he saw a huge reservoir he was drawn towards it he for drinking water and then he found that the reservoir has vanished then the idea came from childhood i have heard of the mirage for the first time i saw it next day again he is going through the desert it's not that he has stopped he is going through the desert and that as he has realized that the it was a mirage that doesn't mean i won't see the reservoir again again i see it but the next day there is a difference i am not attached to it i am not dragged by it i know it's there it's just a mirage so now you are mukta your perspective has changed now your journey can be enjoyable nothing can attach you that then this the purpose of the human life gets solved then as shankaracharya and vivek churamani says that it is a cash down payment you don't have to die to enjoy the happiness in heaven in this life you can enjoy the happiness of being free and that for that the human birth is jivan mukti sukha prapti hetave janma dharana the purpose of the human birth is to enjoy the happiness of liberation in this life here and now not there here and now not there and then after death here and now it's the immediate cash down payment you get it here itself and that's the idea of the karma yoga and that's what bhagwan is indicating sankhya yoga the sankhya idea is very common we have all known i will now introduce into this idea of yoga which not only ends with chitta shuddhi resulting in actionless after chitta shuddhi actionless is there how that as you are equipoised as you are established in yourself you know the self cannot do action the body goes on doing its action as per the will of the divine but actually i am not doing the action so that way the nishkarma siddhi happens but not in the sense that the action has really fallen off action can still continue and you become the divine worker and that's the idea of yoga rura you start as aruruksha so you have to take the entire bhagavad gita as a whole just i read one sloka and i like it ba this this uh, idea in this sloka i understand it helps me to run away but this is a good idea running away can take me to my comfort zone and i just try to interpret the gita just on that idea then i won't, won't be doing the justice the entire sloka that's why sri ramakrishna story always we should remember that when you find a, a one pet idea which you like and that you put it in your armpit then you cannot dance freely don't do that take the scripture as a whole in its entirety have a birds view vision and then only you can really dance freely you need not have to hide anything in your armpit and restrict yourself and get handicapped so let us all be able to dance freely so for that the bhagavad gita has to be understood from its true perspective once we can do that it can it can really become an enjoyable journey so we will continue with the study of the bhagavad gita again in the next class i will find how bhagavan will be re- just re- reiterating this idea from various angles to bring home to uh, arjuna's mind and through arjuna to the entire human kind that this is the easiest way and the best way both we, we are not we sometimes that uh, there this this is a common thing that sometimes you know that the baby is in the tub for bathing and that to throw out the dirty water you throw the baby also to just so that happens with us to get rid of our problem we actually at last annihilate ourselves sometimes the renunciation uh, that forceful renunciation can result in our own destruction 
that when I have a headache, I cannot think of cutting off my head. I have to stay with my head. I cannot, that's not a solution. But all the so-called jnana marga can sometimes lead to that headache means cutting off the head. So Bhagavan has presented this Bhagavad Gita as a wonderful scripture where there is no running away. There is no running. That's why we started with that idea that fear has as being interpreted most probably by Ratan Tata is very nicely that fear can be interpreted in two ways. Forget everything and run. That is fear. The acronym fear becomes an acronym or face everything and rise. So Bhagavad Gita in Bhagavad Gita starts with that fear. Vishada Yoga. Arjuna is fearful, running, trying to run away from the, all the challenges of life. But Krishna is teaching him the second meaning of that acronym. Face everything and rise. And that's how the Bhagavad Gita will continue. So with this, we stop our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskars.